thanks a lot for the introduction, uh, Alina, and thanks a lot to all the organizers for the invitation uh, to the seminar. So yeah, let me start off by setting uh, the scene. So one typical and uh, classical question in number theory is to start off with a sequence of uh, with an interesting sequence of positive integers. So for example, there could be a, an interesting multiplicative property uh, like the sequence of primes. And one of the first properties you would be interested is the asymptotic uh, distribution of that sequence. So how many elements of that sequence are there up to some upper bound X? And the aim would be an asymptotic formula, say. And once that question is pretty well understood, one of the next questions you could be interested in is the behavior of the gaps between successive elements uh, in that sequence. For example, average, uh, the length of the average gap, but also extreme cases, psi, small or large gaps. So one prominent uh, example that has been extensively studied is the sequence of prime numbers. So here, of course, we, uh, we have the famous prime number theorem. And from the prime number theorem, uh, it's easy to get the average uh, gap between consecutive primes. And so if Pn denotes the nth prime, then the average gap has size log Pn. But there could be extreme cases, both regarding uh, short or long gaps. Uh, so for short gaps between primes, of course, we have the famous uh, twin prime conjecture that there are infinitely many primes that have the smallest possible distance to. And so far, this is a major unsolved um, problem in number theory. But recently, uh, there was quite tremendous progress towards that uh, conjecture. So let me quickly summarize uh, a few of these uh, recent results. Uh, so almost 100 years ago, Hardy and Littlewood, under the uh, generalized Riemann hypothesis, uh, they could show that there are infinitely many gaps that are at most two thirds the size of the average gap. Uh, a little bit later, then Erdős got an unconditional uh, result, the constant in front of the log Pn that one minus C is less than one, but it's bigger than two thirds. So quantitatively it's uh, it's a worse result, but it had the big advantage uh, of being unconditional. And then for a long time, the effort uh, concentrated on improving uh, that constant in front of log Pn. So many people worked on this, for example, Davenport and Bombieri had a paper in, in the 60s on this. And then in this uh, century, there was this, uh, a sequence of breakthroughs. Uh, Goldston, Yildirman, and Pins, they could reduce the order of magnitude uh, for small gaps from log Pn roughly to the square root of log Pn. And uh, some years later, another big breakthrough happened. So by independent work of Chang and Maynard. Uh, so we now know th that there are infinitely many prime gaps of bounded size. Uh, there was then subsequently a polymath project uh, which aimed to get uh, C2 down to as small as possible. And as far as I know, uh, 246 is, is the record right now. So coming quite close to the twin prime conjecture. Uh, the question uh, regarding large gaps between consecutive primes is also an interesting one. Uh, using some heuristic evidence, for example, the Cromer model, which uh, assumes that a, a random number of size x is prime with probability one over log x. Using such a, a probabilistic model, you would expect that there are infinitely many gaps as large as log pn square. So right now that seems to be out of reach. Again, let me uh, record a few milestones in that direction. So the average gap between consecutive primes has sized log pn 
uh, in the 30s, Erdős and Rankin obtained infinitely many prime gaps that are slightly larger than the average gap, which is log Pn. So they could enrich log Pn by that uh, lengthy term log log Pn and so on. Uh, again, for a long time then, the effort concentrated on improving on that constant one third here uh, in front. And then again, recently, there was a breakthrough here. So uh, apparently this was one of Erdős' favorite problems. He asked for an improvement, not just of the, of the constant in front, but the order of magnitude of that expression. And recently, uh, Fort Green, Konyagin, Maynard, and Tau were able to remove that power two here in the log 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 p n term in the in uh, in the denominator. So this was a big uh, a recent breakthrough. So the prime numbers are uh, a sequence. Uh, of positive integers that can be obtained from a SIF process, uh, applying the SIF of Eratosthenes. And another interesting sequence you can obtain by a SIF process is the sequence of positive integers that are sums of two squares. In that case, uh, by the two squares theorem, you only SIF by uh, primes which are congruent three mod four. So you get that sequence one, two, four, five, and so on. But this is a sequence which is also very diophantine in nature. So each number in that sequence uh, is represented by that polynomial x square plus y square. So this means there is more techniques available here because of the very uh, diophantine nature of this uh, of this sequence. And now you can ask the same questions. For example, what's the asymptotic uh, distribution of numbers? that are sums of two squares. So here we have uh, Landau's theorem. If you count up to X, how many numbers are sums of two squares? To get an asymptotic formula, the order of magnitude is X over square root of log X. So the density is bigger as for the primes. And here in front, we get uh, that uh, landau ramanujan constant. So therefore, if Sn denotes the nth number, that's the sum of two squares. So the average gap uh, between consecutive numbers that are sums of two squares is of order of magnitude the square root of log Sn. And now you can ask the same questions. How about uh, short gaps? How about uh, long gaps? So the, the 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 short gap question now oh, that's the analog of the uh, twin prime conjecture. This is actually now a much easier problem than for primes. So this is a question you can solve. So it's not hard to show that there are actually infinitely many gaps of length one uh, in the sequence of numbers that are sums of two squares. But actually, you can get more information here. So that's a result Jörg Brüdern and myself obtained uh, uh, in 2011. So if you fix any positive k, then you find infinitely many numbers, infinitely many pairs of, cons uh, of, of numbers that are sums of two squares that are consecutive numbers in that sequence of sums of two squares that have distance exactly k. So you get infinitely many gaps of length exactly k. And in fact, you can even say more. You can you get a good quantitative number of how often that occurs. And you can also generalize instead of considering the sequence of numbers that are sums of two squares, you can consider numbers that are represented by a binary quadratic form. Uh, in that case, probably no longer any possible gap can occur, but you get a local global a principle for existence of gaps of given length. So let me briefly indicate how you could um, prove such a result in the special case. So the sequence of numbers that are sums of two squares and gaps of length uh, two. 
So we want to produce infinitely many gaps of length exactly two uh, in the sequence of numbers that are sums of two squares. And we can do this um, by considering the following Diophantine equation. So x1 square plus x2 square minus x3 square minus x4 squares equals two. And let us impose additional congruence conditions on the variables here. So x1, 2 mod 9, x2, 0 mod 9, and x3 and x4, 1 mod 9. So these congruence conditions are actually uh, compatible with that Diophantine equation because then x1 square plus x2 square minus x3 square minus x4 square is congruent 2 mod 9. That's compatible with the right-hand side too. So this is a quadratic uh, equation in four variables, and this is actually a uh, Diophantine equation for which the circle method can be uh, applied. So this gives you an asymptotic number of solutions of that equation in a growing box. And this way you produce infinitely many uh, pairs of numbers x1 square plus x2 square and x three square plus x four square having difference exactly two. So we, we get a pair of two numbers which are sums of two squares and have difference two. And the number in between is x three square plus x four square plus one. But because of these congruence uh, conditions above, uh, that number is congruent three mod nine and a number three mod nine cannot be a sum of two squares, for example, because the prime three occurs with the odd exponent one in its prime factorization. So by the two square theorem, it can't be a sum of two squares. So this way you can produce infinitely many gaps of length two, and that approach generalizes to any gap length and also to the more general uh, situation of sequences of numbers that are represented by binary quadratic forms. So the situation for short gaps between sums of two squares is, is well understood. Uh, so what's the situation for large gaps? Uh, that seems to be a probably more difficult problem. Uh, you can again, you can adapt the Cramer model from primes to numbers that are sums of two squares. So then the model would assume that a number of size x is a sum of two squares with probability one over square root log x. And then you would expect that if you go up to x, the longest gap is of order of magnitude uh, log x to the 1.5. So the following uh, table has some numerics uh, on that quantity g of x. So I could compute on my MacBook. I I could go as far as five times 10 to the 11. So in each of those intervals, you have the record, the longest gap between consecutive terms in the sequence of numbers that are two squares. And in the third column, log x to the 1.5 divided by g of x, which could provide some maybe weak evidence towards that conjecture that log x to the three, uh, three over two should be the correct order of magnitude. That sequence, so the sequence of record length, uh, I realized it's also one of the sequences that shows up in the online encyclopedia of in integer sequences. And as far as I can see, the longest gap they could find 107. So maybe the 112 is, is a new record for that entry, maybe, not sure. So that's some heuristics. Um, let me now mention a few uh, rigorous results. Uh, so Erdős, uh, improving on earlier work by uh, Turan, he could show that there are infinitely many gaps uh, of order of magnitude log Sn over the square root of log log Sn. And the record stood there for a while. And then Richards basically could remove that 
square root of the log log Sn. So he could show you infinitely often get gaps of size uh, one quarter times the logarithm of Sn. So which is roughly this, uh, the square of the average uh, gap length. And so the, uh, the situation is now uh, a little bit similar to the situation for primes. Uh, right now, it seems hard to improve on that log Sn term. So the focus is on, on improving on that one quarter. Uh, also, the Fort Green Kotinyagin Maynard Tower technique, it doesn't seem to carry over from primes uh, to sums of two squares. In fact, Richards proved a more general result. Uh, maybe let me first mention this. So he considered a more general setting. So let's fix uh, a fundamental discriminant D. And now for that fixed fundamental discriminant, let's consider the sequence S1, S2, and so on of all positive integers that can be represented by any binary quadratic form of that discriminant D then you get infinitely often a gap of size one over uh, the size of the discriminant times log Sn. If you special specialize to the case of sums of two squares, then that's exactly uh, the binary quadratic form x squared plus y squared. Uh, this has discriminant minus four, so you ex exactly recover uh, the result I mentioned on the previous uh, slide. Okay, so this was the state of the art uh, in 82, and apparently there was no improvement since then until recently. So let me mention the first new result. This is joint work uh, with Christian Elsholz, Alexander Kalminin, Sergei Konyagin, and James Maynard. So for the situation of gaps, of long gaps between sums of two squares, we could improve that one quarter in the Richards result to 0 0.868. So that, that's our first result. So here uh, we work pretty hard to squeeze out the best possible uh, outcome. We also have uh, an improvement of that generalist result. So where we consider numbers that are represented by any binary quadratic form of discriminant D. And, and here the improvement is probably more uh, significant. So Richard could show in that setting that you get infinitely often a gap, which is at least as big as one over D times uh, log Sn. And here what we got, so, uh, so these are two bounds, the second one is asymptotic because it has a big O term, that big O of log log D cube. Maybe the first one is easier to digest. So the D minus one over two D for large D, this is roughly uh, one half and the one plus the logarithm of the Euler phi function of D that asymptotically behaves uh, like log D. So roughly the one over D in Richard's result here gets re replaced by a one over two times uh, log D. Uh, the bound in B has the potential to exceed the bound in A slightly for large D, where phi of D is small, small in the sense of phi of D ranges between D minus one and something like D over log log D. And if it's small in that sense, the bound uh, in B uh, asymptotically can produce slightly better results in A, but in A we have an explicit right-hand side without an O term, so it's a little bit, maybe a little bit more useful or at least easier to digest. Uh, yeah, I thought um would be useful now to talk a little bit about uh, the proofs. So let me first illustrate the idea of, of Richard's approach. This is a pretty elementary idea, but it's very clever. So let's fix uh, an arbitrarily small positive epsilon and a given gap size K. 
So for that given k, we now want to produce an interval of length k, where none of the numbers in that interval is the sum of two squares. Uh, to do this, let's introduce some notation. So for every prime three mod four, uh, let beta p be the maximum exponent such that p of beta p is at most 4k, four times the length of the gap. And then we multiply together all those primes 3 mod 4, which are at most 4k. And we multiply p to the beta p plus 1. The plus 1 is important. So that's a huge product, uh, capital P. It's actually an odd number. So therefore, we can solve the following congruence. We can solve the congruence 4y is congruent minus 1 mod p. And we can choose a y, which is at most p. So y will be the starting point of our interval free of numbers that are sums of two squares. And to that end, we want k uh, y to be as small as possible. And now the claim is that none of the numbers in that interval, so none of the numbers y plus 1, y plus 2, up to y plus k, uh, is the sum of two squares. And why is that? So let's consider some number in that interval, some number y plus j. j is in between 1 and k. And it's technically easier to consider 4 times y plus j. That's 4y plus 4j. But 4y is congruent minus 1 mod p. So that number is congruent 4j minus 1 mod capital P. And so the number 4 times y plus j could be huge, but 4j minus 1 is, is a pretty small number. It's in the interval between 1 and 4k, and it's a number which is congruent 3 mod 4. And because 4j minus 1 is congruent 3 mod 4, it must be divisible by a prime p, which is 3 mod 4, to an exact odd power alpha. So a prime p, which is 3 mod 4, divides to exact power, odd power alpha, that number 4j minus 1. And 4j minus 1 is at most 4k. So little p is one of those primes that shows up in that product capital P. Moreover, that alpha, because p to the alpha divides 4j minus 1, that alpha is certainly at most beta p by the definition of beta p. And p of beta p plus 1 divides capital P. So therefore, by that congruence in the last displayed formula, we know that p to the alpha is also the exact power of p dividing 4 times y plus j. We can ignore the 4 because p is odd. So y plus j is divisible by exactly alpha powers of p. Alpha is odd and p is 3 mod 4. Uh, so y plus j cannot be a sum of two squares. So this is a clever and elegant uh, construction. So therefore, all the numbers, uh, all these k numbers from y plus 1 up to y plus k are not uh, sums of two squares. And now, of course, we want the y to be as small as possible in terms of the given uh, uh, length of the gap. So we have to upper bound capital P because we know y is at most p. How can we upper bound p? We use that p to the beta p plus 1 because p to the beta p is at most 4k. We can bound this by 4k in brackets square. So therefore, so using p to the beta p plus 1 is at most 4k square and using the prime number theorem in arithmetic progressions, we can upper bound that huge product p. It will be at most e to the 1 plus our small chosen epsilon times 4k. And now we take the logarithm. So the gap length, gap length is at least log p over 4 times 1 plus epsilon. And because y was at most capital P, k over log, pi, k over log y is at least one quarter apart from that small epsilon. So we can produce a gap of length k starting at some point y and k over log y is at most is at least one quarter. And 
using Landau's theorem. So we know asymptotically how big Sn is. It's very easy. So K will be then Sn plus one minus Sn for some N. It's very easy to get uh, to get that bound in Richard's result. So this is basically the idea uh, how he did it. And at first sight, maybe that looks pretty tight, uh, but there's actually room for uh, improvement. So this argument can be made more efficient. And there's actually two ways to do it. So we called one of these uh, improvements a modular refinement. And on top of this, you can also uh, use a probabilistic trick to get another factor two. Uh, so let me first talk about uh, that modular refinement. Uh, so the idea for both of these refinements is to produce a gap of fixed length K to reduce the size of that product capital K because then our starting point of that interval, that little y, uh, will be smaller. Okay, so let's first uh, look into that uh, modular refinement. So if we go back to this argument, then we've seen that for each j in that interval from one to k, so for each of those numbers, four j minus one that showed up in the product. So because they are three mod four, they are divisible by a prime, three mod four to an exact odd power. So we can write these numbers 4j minus 1 as p to the alpha times r, and then r must be 1 mod 4. So let's analyze what happens if that number 4j minus 1 uh, is composite. So this could be because r is bigger than 1. If r is bigger than 1, because r is congruent one mod four, it has to be at least five. And then if r is at least five, the prime has to be less than four fifth times k because four j minus one is at most four k. Or it could be four j minus one is composite because alpha is bigger than one, but then it's also easy to see that p has to be less than four fifth k, even smaller. Okay, so in our in that product capital P, that huge product which went over all primes up to four k that are three mod four, those primes that are in that pretty long interval at the right end between four fifth k and four k, well, we only need them once in the argument. So if a corresponding number four j minus one is composite, then we never need a prime which is bigger than four fifth k. So we only need such a large prime in the argument. If 4j minus 1 is prime, then 4j minus 1 equals p. So these large primes, they are only needed. So each of those primes eliminates exactly one number in that interval of length k, eliminating in the sense showing it's not a sum of two squares. And this is pretty wasteful because the smaller primes are used to kill off many numbers in that interval. So they are used several times. But these larger primes, their use is somewhat wasteful. They are only used exactly one when p is 4j minus 1. So the idea is to get rid of at least some of those primes. So we can arrange for the starting point y of our interval to be divisible by a 4 because it was defined by a, a, a congruence to an odd a modulus. If the starting point of the interval is divisible by 4, then we automatically know that y plus j cannot, cannot be a sum of two squares if j is 3 mod 4, because numbers that are 3 mod 4 are not sums of two squares. So in other words, so we don't need the primes in that interval from 4 fifth k to 4 k, which are congruent 11 mod 16, because those primes that are 11 mod 16 they would be needed only once, namely if p is 4j minus 1, but it would be a j which is 3 mod 4. And for those j's, we already know y plus j cannot be a sum of two squares. So we can remove from that product capital P all primes in, in that big range 2, which are congruent 11 mod 16. We don't need them any longer 
and the product uh, still goes through. So that reduces the size of that product capital P. So we get that 16 over five instead of five and we would improve the one quarter and Richard's result by five over 16. Uh, but that's not the end of the story. Uh, we can develop that idea further. We, we can go further to the left. So the next interval would be four ninth K up to four fifth K and we can even go a little bit further to the left. And instead of working modulo four, we can also work modulo higher powers of two for some increasing L. So the optimal construction we had actually was found um, by, uh, by a computer search, uh, but it's possible to verify it on paper using pen on paper on a few pages. So that idea can also be used for the situation of numbers represented by general binary quadratic forms of discriminant D. In that case, Richards cons considered uh, instead of numbers of the form 4j minus 1, as before, he considered the progress progression dj plus r, r is, fi is fixed such that the chronicle symbol d over r is minus 1. And in that case, uh, Richards used all the primes up to dk for which that chronicle symbol is minus 1. So he roughly, so uh, approximately half of the primes he used this way. Uh, so note if 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 you consider sums of two squares, d would be four, and the discriminant minus four over p, those primes would be exactly the primes three mod four. So that's a straightforward generalization of the setup from before. And here a similar phenomenon shows up. So if if you are close to the right, so the large primes, which are in some long intervals towards the right and dk. Actually, the argument goes through. You can you can check this. You don't need all the primes for which that chronic symbol is minus one. You don't need half of the primes. It turns out you can show you only need the primes which are congruent that are mod d. So you only need one residue class mod d. And then if you move a little bit further to the left in the next interval, uh, you only need primes p falling into two residue classes, modulo d, and so on. So it's really only if you come very to the left of, of that interval from 1 to dk that you need half or close to half of the residue classes, mod d. And that provides a huge saving. And if you, if you go through the details, it provides that bound in the theorem I, I mentioned before. So that's the modular refinement. Uh, there is another trick you can use. Uh, there's also some um, probabilistic idea uh, you can bring in. So let's go back to that construction from before for sums of two squares. And that product here for large primes in that product, primes which are of order of magnitude k because the beta p it was the maximal exponent such that p to the beta p is at most 4k for those primes the beta p will be one and if beta p is one it makes a big difference whether the exponent of p is beta p or beta p plus one we needed the plus one to make sure if the prime divides our number y plus j it doesn't uh, p square doesn't divide the number y plus j because we wanted to use the two th square theorem to rule out the number as a sum of two squares. So the plus one is crucial to make sure the exact, we know the exact uh, exponent of P dividing that number. But if for those large part, uh, P, we could reduce the exponent from beta P plus one uh, to beta P, then the exponent would go down from two to one. And that would roughly reduce the size of capital P to its square root. And that would amount to a doubling of the length of uh, uh, of the interval, which is free of numbers 
of sums of two squares. And this is actually doable. This can be done by a, uh, by a probabilistic argument. So when considering such an interval starting at y, we want to make sure that if one of the numbers in the interval is divisible by such a large prime p, it's not divisible by p squared. That's enough for the argument to go three through. And that leads to a convergence if, and that actually can be achieved. And this way, using this argument on top of the other one, so kind of the probabilistic refinement commutes with the modular one, you can use it on top of it and it leads to a doubling of the length of the gap you would get by the modular refinement al alone. Yeah, and if you if you follow through this, uh, then you get exactly that 1.868 I mentioned before. So the complicated fraction is due to both of these refinements taking place. You could also use that um, probabilistic refinement on top of the modular refinement for sequences which are represented by general binary quadratic forms. But there, so the huge improvement going from one over t to one over two times log d comes from, from the modular considerations, but you could squeeze out another factor too, but uh, for the sake of simplicity, we refrained. we've refrained from doing this um, uh, in our paper. Okay, uh, so in, in, uh, in the last third of the talk, I want to speak about uh, kind of a generalization or a slightly different direction, and that's about long gaps between numbers that are sums of two squares in kind of nonlinear intervals. So instead of considering, say, an interval starting at y, y plus 1, y plus 2, y plus 3, you could also consider something like y plus 1 square, y plus 2 square, y plus 3 square, and so on. So we are looking into, into polynomials of this form. So some starting point CD, and then we shift by powers of x. Of course, there are trivial cases. For example, if d is 2 and cd is 1, then 1 plus x square is always a sum of two squares. Um, but you could ask, if you, if you fix a certain exponent d, is it then possible to choose a starting point cd such that you get a very long sequence of consecutive numbers xd such that pd of x is not a sum of two squares. And if d is a composite number, we actually have a, uh, have a very satisfying uh, answer to that question. So that's the next uh, theorem. So if d is an even number, then the polynomial six plus x to the d is never, so it, it never attains a value which is the sum of two squares. So you get an infinite sequence of consecutive x's. And we get a similar result if the exponent d is odd and composite. So let q be the least prime factor of, uh, of d in that case. It's then also odd, of course. Then the starting point is cq times q to the q for that number cq given in part b. And then again, for no x, you get a sum of two squares. So again, you get an infinite sequence of consecutive x, which never hits the sum of two squares. Uh, interestingly, if your exponent is two or three, then it's impossible to find such a starting point set the a CD such that CD plus x to the D is never a sum of two squares. We conjecture, that C holds true for all prime exponents D, but actually we can uh, only prove it at the moment for, for two and three. Uh, the, the proof of A is, is, is pretty trivial. So if D, is, um, if D is even and at least four, then you can just distinguish better X is odd or even six plus X to the D is three mod four if X is odd, so can't be a sum of two squares. Six plus X to the D is six mod eight if X is even. So again, cannot be a sum of two squares. So the, this is kind of uh, the easier trivial part. 
it's the part B of the of the result which is actually uh, the most interesting one. And this is inspired by work of uh, Jackie and Kaplansky on Waring's problem for mixed exponents. So they considered Waring's problem x squared plus y squared plus z to the nine and made the observation that there is uh, an increasing sequence of positive integers that are not represented in this form, though so, uh, there are no congruence obstructions. And this is very much related. So let's suppose D is odd and composite. Q is the least prime factor. It's also odd. So then D2 is, is bigger than one. And let's for simplicity discuss the case where Q is three mod four. Then this constant CQ was two. So we are looking in the, into the polynomial two Q to the Q plus Z to the D. Let's suppose that's the sum of two squares for some z and reach a contradiction. And in the end, this will follow from con congruence considerations, but in a, in a highly non-trivial way. So z cannot be even. That's the first consideration, because then you can take out a 2 to the q from the equation, then n over 2 to the q would be q to the q plus that other term because d1 is bigger than 1, that z to the q times d2 over 2 to the q is still divisible by 4. So you get a number 3 mod 4, uh, which cannot be a sum of two squares. So z cannot be uh, even. And it can also cannot be 3 mod 4, because if z is 3 mod 4, then 2q to the q plus z to the d would be 3 mod 4. And again, it cannot be a sum of two squares. So z has to be one mod four. And now you factorize that polynomial. You factorize two q to the q plus z to the d into these two bits. Let n one be two q plus z to the d two, and let n two be that bracket. And that first factor n one is three mod four because uh, q is three mod four and z is one mod four. And now we can use a similar trick as before. We use the two squares theorem because n1 is 3 mod 4. There must be a prime number t which divides n1 to an odd exact power. Then this t to an exact, this t to an odd power also divides n, but n was supposed to be a sum of two squares. So as t is 3 mod 4 by the two squares theorem, also n2 must be divisible by, by t. So there must be a prime t, which is three mod four, and divides both factors, n1 and n2. As t divides n1, 2q has to be congruent minus z to the d2 mod t. And this you can plug in into the explicit formula for n2. You find n2 is congruent q times z to the d minus d2 mod t. And yeah, if t, uh, so there are two cases, t can divide q or it couldn't divide q. If t divides q, you can check then it divides n1 to exact power 1 and n2 to exact power q minus 1. So t divides n to exact power q. So t3 mod 4 q is, is, is odd. So that's a contradiction to n being a sum of two squares. And if t does not divide q, uh, then from the for formula four here, if, if, if t does not divide q because n2 is congruent q times z to the d minus t2 mod t, if t does not divide q, it has to divide z. And because it divides 2q plus z to the d2, which is n1, it has to divide 2q. As it does not divide q, it has to be two, which is a contradiction to t being three mod four. So you get a contradiction in all cases, and it follows from congruence considerations, but only after you do that factorization. You can't use the congruence consideration immediately right from the start. That wouldn't work. Uh, that's a little bit akin to situations where the local global principle for a Diophantine equation fails because of some uh, brouwer manin obstruction. And the last bit, part C, 
there is an elementary proof, for example, in the cubic case, we have to show if you fix any starting point CD, then um, CD plus, uh, then you can all, uh, 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 then if you, if you fix a starting point CD, uh, then you can CD always write as the sum of two squares minus a cube of a positive number, uh, because the statement in part C was saying it's impossible to find a starting point CD such that CD plus X cube is never a sum of two squares. So we have to consider uh, the Diophantine equation CD um, is uh, X square plus Y square uh, minus a positive cube. If we can solve this, then uh, part C is settled. And this actually follows using a trick of Elkis, Kaplansky, and, and Adler. Uh, so they found a, a set of covering congruences, mod 16, showing that every integer can be written as a sum of two squares plus a cube, but the cube actually is negative, as you can see here from that parametrization. And a similar, a similar approach is possible for the case of exponent two. So this is elementary, but kind of tricky. So that leaves open the case of prime exponents bigger than three. We conjecture that whenever the exponent D is a prime, then it's always impossible to find a constant CD, a starting point CD, such that CD plus X to the D is, uh, is never a sum of two squares. But that, that actually looks like a pretty a hard conjecture in Diophantine geometry. Uh, what we can do uh, for those prime B, so that outstanding case not covered in that theorem, we get the following result on long gaps in that polynomial sequence CD plus X to the D. If you fix an odd prime number D and you fix a given gap size K, then you can always find uh, a starting point, so a small uh, starting point YK, such that YK from that starting point YK, if you shift by J to the D for K consecutive values, one, two, up to K to the D, you never get um, a sum of two squares. And this is now kind of a higher degree analog of that result from before. So for that limb sub, you get that lower bound, um, probably the, the the displayed formula, displayed formula in the middle is a little bit easier to digest at first sight. That gives you a good indication of the uh, of the order of magnitude. We also have an explicit uh, result. So if D is at least seventeen, then um, so the gap length length over the log of that starting point infinitely often is at least as big as um, one over fifty six times the square root of the logarithm of D. So the order of magnitude here. Uh, we got is one over uh, the square root of log d. So the case d equals one. So y k plus j to exponent one, that would be exactly the case of intervals of length k free of numbers that are sums of two squares. And the analog there would be our previous result that's 0 0.868. So this is kind of um, a higher degree uh, analog of, of, of that. So um, I believe this is uh, this is all I wanted to say, and I stayed within the in the fifty minutes. Um, ah, yes, yeah. The the proof here, I I don't have time to to talk about the proof, but it's similar to the ideas before. But um, the algebraic side is a little bit more complicated. We need some clever polynomial identities and also some explicit estimates from from analytic number theory go go in. Okay, that's all I wanted to say.